Okay, so last uh, couple of lectures have been on the dynamic mode decomposition. And kind of showed you an algorithmic way, right, to take some nonlinear dynamical system, simply take snapshots of this thing. In fact, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to actually go back to just, yeah, okay, it's easy enough, easy fix. So this is the actual system. So x is the state variable. And just by simply constructing big data matrices, which has x at different points in time, I can take snapshots of this, and over that time window, I can approximate this with a linear dynamical system. Okay? That was the whole point. Take data. You don't know what f is. That was part of the issue. You just know you're measuring something. It has an f. Generally, when you measure something, uh, in at least most physical engineering biological systems, there's something that produced the data. There was some process. You may or may not know it. It's really interesting, actually. You can apply this kind of things also towards social data, but we also, it's not clear we believe there's a governing equations for social data. Like, is there an equation for how people hit like buttons or how they buy things, right? Are we pulled by something like gravity to do such things? Like, we don't necessarily believe that. There's certainly patterns you can certainly capitalize on to do that, and they do. However, this is more towards this idea that something generated the data. There was, it wasn't just people doing likes and things. It was some process, but you just may not know what it is. I'm going to approximate it with this. Okay? That was the DMD. Uh, we're going to build on this idea. And uh, I'm going to start off by saying a couple things. The first thing is this. Why did I write this like this? Typically, you wrote this like this because you measured x. OK? So you said, that's my variable. I measured it. I might be temperature or pressure or something in the system that seems reasonable. But I'm going to come back and say, just because you measured it doesn't make it the right variable. Okay? We oftentimes write things down in a set of variables. Our textbooks are full of this, writing f down. That still doesn't make it the right variable. What I mean by the right variable? What I'm going to do is try to explain to you maybe what the right variable should be. Okay? All right. Now, this should be blowing your minds a little bit in the sense that I was indoctrinated in the education system of physics and engineering where you say, like, here's your model, here's Maxwell's equations, here's gravity, F equals MA, here's quantum mechanics, and whatever I wrote down, that equation, that is the right variable. Right? Same with you. And so part of the goal here in this idea of Koopman theory is to say, Actually, maybe there's a better set of variables. Okay? We're already talking a lot about, in this class, matrix decompositions, like the SVD, where we say there's a subspace that might be better to work with. So we're already trading out for a better set of variables. This is no different. But now I'm doing it all the way back up to here, where you may feel a little uncomfortable about it. Okay? So what's the goal? The goal is this, okay? So it's called Koopman theory. It's not new. It goes back to 1931. Guess what Koopman, Bernard, let's just call him Bernard, first name basis. Guess what Bernard did not have back in 1931? MATLAB for sure, and MATLAB was sitting inside of a computer. 
you're pretty limited if you don't have a computer, right? 1931. You know that the first atmospheric science calculations were done by this guy Richardson, and he gridded up some parts of Europe, and he actually by hand computed a numerical discretization scheme. Do you know that most of the initial calculations uh, for NASA and also for the, uh, a lot of in the early 40s when we were working on the bomb projects, the word came, computer came from you were a computer. You computed things. And so what you would do is you would discretize a set of equations and you say, well, if I'm evolving them in time, that means whatever computations you do, right, it cascades to future times. So you guys are time zero. You guys are time one, time two. You pass your calculations back. And if you are spatial points, you would integrate their spatial points and say, well, I got to add your calculation to your calculation, divide by two. Pass them back to Emily. And this is how computations are done. It's kind of awesome, right? If you actually think about this, this is like kind of amazing. Like, I like the computer. That's pretty awesome. It's, it's, I wouldn't have to do that anymore. But that's where the word computer came from. 1931, he has no computer, but he's thinking about dynamical systems. He's thinking about nonlinear dynamical systems. And so he started thinking about this idea and said, look, what if I took this thing, and what if I am able to construct a new variable, or a new set of variables, which are functions of x? So I'm going to move from a finite dimensional vector space, potentially into an infinite dimensional function space. That's the idea. And in this infinite dimensional space, basically the definition of Kuban is you say, move into the space such that essentially, uh, let me write it down the right way, so that uh, actually the way he wrote it down is as a, uh, in a discrete time system. So here it is, g of x of k plus 1 is equal to k g x of k. Let's just get our heads around this. I am at time x of k. To get to the time into the future x of k plus 1 in this variable, I hit it with a linear operator. That's the Koopman operator. I've got the k. It takes me from a set of functions of x to another set of functions of x linearly. Okay? Potentially in an infinite dimensional space. Okay, think about what I just told you. Essentially, what I'm saying is you take a nonlinear dynamical system. There's a set of observables that linearize it. Okay? Now, what Koopman did not tell you is how to get g. So it seems like magic. It kind of is. But the big question is, how do you get g? Okay? I know. Good question. <laughs> Does that make sense to everybody right now? Where well, I'm going to go after this. So this is the idea behind Koopman, is that I want to take this nonlinear dynamical system, and the only way I can solve this in general, typically, is computationally. You run it on your computer, because you don't have analytic solutions. So nonlinear science was largely enabled by the fact that we had computers to evolve these nonlinear dynamics. This is when we found out all kinds of interesting things that happen in nonlinear dynamical systems including sensitivity to initial data, chaos, and other such interesting phenomena. But that's if you work in the original variable. This says, maybe there's a route to which I go over here. So the idea really here is, in some sense, in this new coordinate y, which has come from here, that I actually do have that. Remember, that's what DMD was trying to give me, except DMD was just approximating the best linear thing possible. This is actually saying, oh, there is a linear dynamics 
in the right coordinate system. Okay? Now, let's build on this because it's, it becomes actually a pretty uh, interesting in general. So I want to go back to a, a simple dynamical system and show you how this actually works. This is like a Boyson de Prima level problem. Do you guys have Boyson de Prima for like ODEs, maybe? You, whatever, you took, uh, that's like the, one of the classic books. It's got, it's in the 55th edition. I don't know, it's actually like 12. But like every two years, right, they'll sell you another textbook for 250 bucks. And call it a new edition, and they just swap two sections. They make a killing. Uh, consider the following. X1 dot is equal to mu x1, x2 dot is equal to lambda x2. Uh oh, I think it's minus x1 squared. Let me get my right page here. I should have left it open to the right page, too, in addition, right? Yeah, here we go. Okay? Here is the system I want to consider. It's nonlinear. So I don't have exact solutions. So one of the things that we do with nonlinear systems, when we have them here, it's because that nonlinearity right there, you say like, okay, well, I can look for fixed points, look at the stability of the fixed points, and I can catch, and I can, I can sketch out what the solution should look like. This is the, like a qualitative theory of differential equations that you might have, okay? We're not going that route. So nonlinear system, and I'm going to show you I can make it linear. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define a new variable set. Here are my new variables. y1 is equal to x1. y2 is equal to x2. So, so far, no new variables. But I'm going to add a y3, which is going to be equal to x1 squared. Okay, so that's my new variable, and we're going to ask the question, what does that equation look like in the y space? Okay, fair enough. So, okay, all right, well, let's do some math here, differentiate both sides. x1 dot is equal to, sorry, y1 dot is equal to x1 dot. Oh, but what's x1 dot equal to? Well, x1 dot... It's right over here, it's mu x1, mu x1, but x1 is y1. I get back pretty much the same equation, unchanged, right? Let's do now a derivative here. y2 dot is equal to x2 dot, x2 dot, well that's given right by here. It's lambda x2 minus x1 squared, so I have the lambda x2, well x2 is y2 minus x1 squared. Oh look, I have a new variable that is x1 squared, it's called y3. So I just put that in there. Good? Now let's think about what y3 dot is. So that's 2x1, x1 dot. Everybody hopefully will agree with that little Super sweet chain rule. All right. So, oh, sorry, to x1, x1 dot, because I just differentiated that, which is actually 2, x1 is y1, all right, and uh, x1 dot, sorry, here, let's, let's, before I change variables, let me do the following. Let's just do this all out. So, 2 x1, what's x1 dot? Well, x1 dot is right there. Mu x1, which is equal to 2 mu x1 squared. Hey, what's, what's x1 squared? y3. So, what did I just do? I said, here is your nonlinear two by two system, and now I can write it in the following form. So 
So y is going to be the vector y1, y2, y3. And notice, y1 dot is equal to mu y1. Then I have a 0 lambda minus lambda, which is y2 minus y3, the lambda in front of it. And in the last row, you have 0, 0, 2, mu. Boom. I just made a coordinate change. I have a linear system. There is no more like look for fixed points, approximate, simulate. I have an exact solution now for all time, for all th anything. I have everything. This is the power of making linear systems. This is the one thing we know how to solve, linear systems. That's the only thing we actually have a lot of confidence to solve. Let me be more precise. Linear constant coefficient. That's the only thing we know how to solve. I should never even just say we know how to solve linear systems. We don't really, because if you have a time dependent term in front of a linear term, I'm still screwed. All right? But if it's linear constant coefficient, that's about all I can solve. And I like this because all of control theory is framed in this thing. And I just said, take this nonlinear system and make it linear. Boom. Smack down. Uh, are you guys, OK, nobody's that excited except for me. That's OK. I'll just be up here all excited by myself. That's how it is anyway, all the time. I'm up here. I try so hard. You guys just can't get your energy up. Ugh. Maybe you guys going to eat more bananas in the morning, something. Increase your energy, your chi. Maybe meditate before class. What's that? I think something. I go work out at the gym, so I get my, I'm all ripped when I get up here. I mean, so I have to cover it all up with the suit. It's just like, right? Brings it in a little bit. <laughs> Occasionally, some people show up at the gym. Jared did the other day. That was too tough for you, though. Like one morning like that, just wiped you out. OK, he can't respond. OK. <laughs> all right. So OK, anyway, super exciting. And you think, like, this is awesome. I'm going to go conquer all these problems now because you're telling me I took a nonlinear problem, make it linear. OK, let's talk about some consequences or some issues that are going to be left on the table. <laughs> talk about this guy for a minute. Nonlinear system. So what you know about a nonlinear system is that if you do the standard way to say, how would I look at that nonlinear system, you'd go look for fixed points. Well, what if this had thing three fixed points? OK, great. No big deal. You find them, you linearize, you sketch a face plane. How many fixed points does this have? One at the origin. A linear system, one fixed point. What happened to all my other fixed points? OK, this is problematic, right? Hopefully you see that's a problem. I can't just like, you know what we did? We swept them away to infinity. This is essentially what this did. When you build that Koopman operator, if you get a linear system out of this thing, you essentially said is, yes, I've got three of them. I'm going to build a Koopman around one of these fixed points. The other guys move to infinity away from me. Okay? So one way to think about it is that if I have something like this with n fixed points, I should get n Koopman embeddings. Essentially, you take a fixed point and you make it linear Okay. for each one. And that linear embedding will work until you get out and hit the other one. Although the fact is that since it went to infinity, who cares? It went away. All right. That's one thing. That's the first thing right off the bat. Second thing right off the bat. Let's try this again. But now uh, I'm going to try it for a slightly different problem. Uh, let me see. I think I have it here. Uh, one second. All right, I don't think I have it there, but who cares? Let's just make something up. 
Uh, nonlinear system. All right, let's do this. Uh, maybe not, let's do this. Uh, um, I'm just going to make some stuff up. <laughs> I thought I had written it down here. Uh, but clearly, I don't think I did. Hold on, let me just see. I should just double check. I always hate to do this when I'm in the middle of class, but nothing is as bad as when I program that day. So that's kind of the bottom. So everything else is can only be up from there. I didn't put it there, but let's just make something up. So remember, what did I have here before? I had lambda. Uh, x2 minus x1 squared. All right, well, let's just make this, um, I don't know, seems pretty simple. It seems like a general method. So what if I had done something like, uh, that instead? OK, let's just see if it, OK, it's going to go south on us. So it doesn't matter if I pick wrong, because <laughs> typically, in this case, it's always really nice because I just want to show you how bad it can go for yourself. Let's try to see if this will go south on us. Um, all right, so here's a new set of equations. Hardly looks any different than what I had before, right? So let's just go with what we had before. <coughs> x1, uh, so y1 is equal to x1, y2 is equal to x2, and y3 is equal to uh, now we want maybe x2 squared or something like that. Uh, all right, so y2 dot, so this one will just get a generic first equation again, will be x2 dot, what's x2 dot? Lambda, x2 squared minus x1, right, which is lambda y3 minus y1. Let me see if I, I might have to pick something a little more, go south, let's see. And then y3 dot is equal to 2 x2, x2 dot, all right, so now you have uh, 2 x2. x2 dot now is x2 squared minus x1, right? With a lambda. So you get 2 lambda x2 cubed minus x1 x2. OK, well, that didn't go as well as I'd hoped, right? Because I got a cube out, and I only have squared. So it means I'm going to have to start adding more variables here. Like I might have to do things like x2 cubed. And look, I got an x1 and x2, so I might have to add things like this. Now, this is generally what happens. So even though I gave you this magic show right at the beginning, right? It's like, look, it works out. <laughs> it doesn't work out usually. OK, so I feel bad about lying to you a little bit. But not so much. I wanted to show you an illustration of how it might work. And in fact, normally, a perfect embedding to a higher dimensional space never happens because of what you're seeing here. It just cascades. Yes, you can build a linear system, but the linear system keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because you need more variables. This is often what's called the closure problem. The closure problem is it doesn't close on itself. It just keeps a cascading to infinity, which in some sense from Koopman, he says, like, I don't care. I told you to go to an infinite dimensional space, which, fine, going to infinity, big deal if you're doing paperwork. Going to infinity on paper, nobody gets hurt. Doing infinity in real life hurts people because you can't actually solve the problem. Right? So this is an illustration of how this closure problem starts to cascade out of control on you. Okay? But let's not lose hope because in some sense what I'm going to say is about this is that your ability in some sense to make something exactly linear is highly suspect. What you really want to do is something, it's mostly linear. You took a strongly nonlinear system, you found a great coordinate system to make it 
weakly nonlinear. And if it's weakly nonlinear, then you can do things like perturbation theory, you know. This Kuhn operator has a dominant term plus corrections. So that's actually the real goal, Koopman. Still finding a better set of coordinates. Now, let me tell you about how Koopman has actually been known for a while. Does anybody know this equation here? It's rather a famous equation. It's called Berger's equation. It's been around for a long time. So this is a partial differential equation. The subscripts denote time and space derivatives. So we'll do a little bit of solving of PDEs in the course as well, besides just dynamical systems. So in, th in general, this is hard. Why? Because this term here. So this is a famous equation just in itself. What does it look like? Well, another famous equation. There's so much fame on this board right now. It's, um, it's unbearable. Do you guys want some signatures? Take some selfies up here before into the class. Oh, five bucks per selfie. It's all for a good cause. Uh, One-way wave equation. So let me tell you the cascade up of why this happened historically. People, one-way wave equation. I can write down a solution to this, and it's pretty nice. It's a traveling wave, x minus ct. So if you go in there, it's just whew, things moving. People like that. People were like, oh, I understand a little bit about waves. Okay, We see waves pop up all over the place, and that's a solution to this. Then people started to realize, like, yeah, I see waves, but things happen to waves. You go to the beach, what happens to waves? Well, stuff happens like they roll over and they break. And sometimes they're big and they knock you on your can, right? And you roll you around. That's not a linear wave. That's just a thing that's traveling. It's like it, it's traveling with a vengeance. It comes to destroy you. And in fact, if you actually look at waves on the beach, as they come to shore, something so interesting happens. The top of the wave moves faster than the bottom of the wave. So a pile of mass starts to move faster, and eventually, that's what flips it over. So people started trying to think about, how do I model that? The wave speed now, which was c, depends on the height u. So they said, wave equation, now it's nonlinear. So when you have a wave traveling here, and I've put a wave in, what it's going to do is going to start doing this. Top is moving faster than the bottom. It does this, and eventually, what's going to happen? It's going to break. And of course, this is weird because we don't like functions in math that are discontinuous in general. And this, will, in fact, is a finite time shock that happens, and then people kind of glue something together like this and say that's the shock. Okay, so this goes back a long ways. People are very interested in this in aeronautics, fluids. Then you go like, okay, this doesn't actually happen in real life. Things don't become discontinuous. When I look at a lot of waves that start to do this, other things happen. There's other physics that got neglected that come in to play a role. And so in this case here, people said, add a little bit of diffusion. So this is what's called Berger's with diffusive regularization. Remember we talked about regularization? Everything's regular. You know, if you don't like a solution, regularize it. In other words, put something on it that <laughs> makes you happy. Okay? It's a constraint. Now, this thing here, it's a second derivative. So when it really starts to curl up like that, the second derivative becomes huge, which means the diffusion becomes really big, which means this thing won't actually break. This thing will just instead propagate like that. In other words, the diffusion arrests the collapse of the wave. So, okay, fine. History. You got a little history lesson. I'm not even being paid to teach a history course, but look, I'm double timing right now, teaching history and math all at the same time. That's pretty impressive, I think, right? Uh, all right. So, in the 1950s, this was such an important equation because people were really trying to understand it. Uh, two people, 
Cole and Hoff in two different papers, Julian Cole, I can't remember Hoff's last na first name, uh, they, they actually found a transformation for this problem. It's kind of a, one of, it's sort of a rare find, which is they said there's a new variable v, where in this new variable v, this equation becomes linear. This essentially is a Koopman transformation. I take a nonlinear PDE, which is very difficult to solve. I can approximate some things, and I can write it down as a linear PDE, which I can write down everything for it. So this is actually what you're trying to do in Koopman. And all I have to know is that <coughs> there is a transformation uh, that V is some function of U, and vice versa. And that's called the Kohlhoff transform. 1950, 51. We haven't discovered very many. <laughs> okay? Uh, and this does exact linear embedding. And like I said, I think it's a little bit tough to say things can be exactly embedded linearly. I think that's just not going to happen in general. So what you want is mostly, okay, change exact for mostly. Which is not a which is a very refined math term, and, uh, and that's what we want to do. It's like how can I actually make this thing as linear as possible, because it's not going to be exactly embedded linearly. Everybody go with this. Okay, so that was long-winded. I'm going to go through the code and I'm going to show you some example. And the whole purpose of this is to say, I have that u is my variable. In fact, u makes sense physically. It's, you know, the height of the wave. It's, it's like a it's for you, like, of course, that's what you'd measure. That is the important variable. There's another variable, v, that says, actually, no. In this variable, in this coordinate system, everything's linear. I can solve all of it by hand. I can write down the solutions on a piece of paper for you. No computer necessary. I would say that v is the right variable. And v is not the variable you'd ever pick. But it's the right variable for the problem. Okay. So that's the idea of Koopman. Nonlinear, make it linear. All right. And already DMD has hinted at that. And by the way, let me say this. All we're going to do to compute the Koopman operator, two steps. Step one, pick a set of observables. Step two, do DMD on it. So how did I get that model? I just did a DMD algorithm on it. So I took this thing, DMD to get that. All we're going to do is say, all right, we'll make up a new variable set and do DMD in it to get that. Okay? So that's how we compute the Koopman operator. I'm working out. Just curls. I hope I don't pop out of the suit. Okay, hold on. All right. Come on, buddy. Stay down. <laughs> there. Woo. All right. Let me uh, AV unmute that. Come on. All right. So I have some pre written code because this is a little bit longer example and involves the solution of a partial differential equation. And so uh, it's there. I mean, whether you, you can make use of it, it's, it's fine. I think I want to mostly illustrate what happens here. So the problem I'm going to solve is what's called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Somebody write it down here. I u t plus 1 half u x x plus mod u squared u is equal to 0. It's got a Schrodinger type operator, so this is what you get in quantum mechanics. So it's like a one wave, it's like a wave equation where you only specify one initial either data or velocity, which the reason Schrodinger wrote it down is he said, I need something to be a wave. I need a wave type equation. So they knew this in quantum mechanics, things seem to behave like waves, so I need something like a wave. But the two way wave equation that they were kicking around requires two initial conditions violating Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because you can't specify the position and the velocity simultaneously. So what they wanted here is like, okay, I want a wave equation, but 
I only want to specify one of those because I can't specify both. So Schrodinger wrote that piece down. And usually there's a potential here of v of x u. But here, the potential is created by its own self intensity. So this comes up in nonlinear optics, comes up uh, largely there, some fluids, uh, deep, wa deep water waves, things like this. OK, anyway, who cares? PD. Let me run it for you. I'll show you what it looks like. So it's nonlinear. That's the main thing. It's a fully nonlinear system. It's really hard to solve unless you just have a computer cranking on things on it. OK? So what I'm going to do is solve it. And what I'm going to do with solving it is I'm going to pick a domain, size 30, chop it up into 512 points. That's my space. I'm going to make it x2 is going to be a linear space that goes from negative L2 to L2 in n plus 1 points. I'm going to use periodic boundary conditions. So I break it up, and the last points can be the same as the first. So, oops, maybe I should just sit here. And I will highlight it with my cursor. All right, here we go. So there you go. This is going to break up my space domain from negative L over 2, L over 2, and n plus 1 points. And all I care about is the first 1 through n points, because with periodic boundaries, the last point is the same as the first. I'm going to solve it using what's called a spectral method. So I'm going to Fourier transform the whole thing into the Fourier domain, evolve it up in time. And if you uh, want more details on that, uh, the lectures we're going to have on model reduction that are coming up not next week, but the week after, there will be more of this kind of stuff in there. And I go into more detail on the code. OK? Here, blah, blah, blah. All right, uh, let me just plot what it does. Uh, OK, right here, run section. I just want to show you the evolution of this thing. OK, here's what it does. I ran it from time 0 to time pi. But uh, OK, it's doing some kind of breathing, essentially. That's what it's doing there. Uh, and this is actually quite a complicated nonlinear interaction that generates this. OK? Uh, so it looks simple, but part of what I did is said, let's just evolve something at least looks fairly simple, but, the, but actually producing this is, is not so, so easy. There's a lot of theory behind what's going on here. So this thing is evolving. This is what's called a soliton. So it's a localized structure that continues to return to itself. Uh, and that's just the evolution of that system. Okay? Now it's fully nonlinear, so I'm having a hard time understanding it unless you know, do a bunch of education around it. And who wants to do a bunch of education around this? Maybe you do, you're okay. But maybe you just like, dude, I'm just casual about this whole thing. Me and NLS are just like friends. Like, I don't even know the guy. So, so this is going to be like how we get to know NLS a little bit, but not really care. Okay? All right, so that's the evolution. And now, suppose I just saw this and I measured it. And I don't know the equations. I just see this thing. I want to be able to build a model for it to predict the future. Because remember, this is time here. And I might want to say, like, well, what's, you know, could I give you a prediction of the future state of the system? OK. Oh, check it out. Here, I make a data matrix x, which is the solution. But now what I do, I transpose it here so that it's space is in the columns, sorry, is all along the columns in the rows. And each column is a snapshot in time. OK? So exactly what we did with DMD last time, right? I remember I lined up space in the rows, and then each one was a snapshot was a time snapshot. That's what I just did here. And then you see this here? That's the DMD algorithm. You clearly recognize it from the last class, right? You can pretend you do. Okay, I don't care. Point is, you take the data. Remember, take x1, which is column 1 to n minus 1. Column 2 is 2 to the n. And you're trying to look for a matrix A that connects you this way. right? So the first thing you do is you do an ETH SVD. You do your similarity transform, find A tilde, eigen decompose it, go back out to your modes. 
Okay? I picked the rank here. I put 10. I did 10 mode truncation. Okay, I can play around with that. We'll, we will play around with it with the code. So this is just this is exactly last lecture. This code. Okay. So I'm going to take that data, those, this thing that was doing this breathing, and I'm going to just say do DMD on it. And I'm going to build a, a linear model and just going to be able to try to predict the future with it. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right, so now I get the initial data, and then I build my DMD. Here it is, blah, blah, blah. And then I can plot my DMD prediction. So, oops, I didn't want to run all those yet. Let's, uh, where's my, uh, okay, so first do here, run. Okay, I think. I don't want to run it all at once to like give it all away yet. Okay, let's see what I got here. Oh, I'm going to plot it at the end. Okay, so let me show you some stuff then. I know what I'm doing. All right, maybe. <laughs> These are your first 10 DMD modes. And you could ask, why did I plot them all small in the corner there? Well, we'll get to that later. Here are DMD modes. These are the first 10 modes. They have some structure, and it actually kind of looks reasonable, right? Remember, the DMD modes are not orthogonal. They don't have to be. But these are the first 10 modes describing that pulse doing this. And you can see, look, there's that fat thing there that would probably describe the thing going out, skinny things, fatter things, double bumps. Like, you could probably think, oh, that's a basis for gluing all together to make it look like what I saw. Now, the eigenvalues of those are given by here. These are the DMD eigenvalues. Imaginary axis, real axis. So first of all, what I showed you was purely periodic. So all the eigenvalues should have been on the imaginary axis, and they are not. OK, no big deal. It's an approximation. Well, I'll get all worked up. Well, here's a big deal, maybe. Am I right? This is why I always frame it. DMD in practice is to try to get you a reasonable short time future state prediction. You're not going to go long time here. And the reason you're not going to go long time future state prediction, did you see that eigenvalue right there? It's a little bit over on the real part. What's going to happen to it? It's going to make the solution blow up. It's going to be E to that thing. It's going to oscillate and go. That's all right. It's going to take a while to do that. So you're going to be able to get a little ways out to make a prediction before it misbehaves on you. Okay? So that's what you get straight up DMD. Even though I know if I had periodic behavior, all those eigenvalues should, doggone it, be right on that imaginary axis. You like the way I said doggone it? it sounds awesome. It's like, like what your dad would say. <laughs> All right, I'm not your dad. I am your father. Okay, all right, Koopman. By the way, who's going to be Ray's parents? Anybody thought about that yet? He totally lied, didn't he? he? He said, you're just some orphan. She wasn't, was she? She's got to like, be somebody. <laughs> all right, that's maybe, a, we, we can talk theories later. Let's make sure to post it up on the discussion board. Okay, you win a Chipotle burrito if you get it right. I won't pay up for about another year or two, right, when the movie comes out. All right. Well, here's what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to go ahead and say, I know those are maybe not the best variables. Why? Because it was a nonlinear system, and clearly when I did it, I didn't get periodic behavior. So I'm going to make up two new potential variables to work with, some g of x's. One of them is this, x1, x1 dot absolute value x1 x squared. So why did I pick this? Well. Look at the form of my equation. That's what my nonlinearity was. Now, it could be that I don't know exact equation or what the parameters are, but I know that like, you know, in this system, it's got a quadratic nonlinearity or a cubic. A lot of times you know this just from symmetry constraints of physics. And in this case here, you have an intensity-dependent 
nonlinearity. Intensity dependent in the sense that it doesn't care about the phase. It's absolute value squared. All it cares about is intensity. So I said, okay, that's great. Use that as part of my observable. In other words, my g of x is x and mod x squared x. Why? Because I don't know it's what's there. Right? That's what I picked here. I also say, well, how about just pick something else? What if I just had mod x squared without that? So it's just that intensity alone. So I made up two new observables. So here's one set of observables with the nonlinearity. Here's another. And notice what I did here is y1 and y2 are these two snapshot matrices that you're trying to get a matrix going from here to here or from here to here. These are now nonlinear observables. And the question is, what difference does it make? I have a pretty good approximation. I got some eigenvalues. Maybe not the best, but who cares? I did DMD. The question is, how does this help me? All right. So all I do is do DMD on those. There's the code. Blah, 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 blah. OK. And so let's run this whole thing. And let me highlight all the results of this, because we are running on time. But hopefully you'll see the power. All right, here it is. This is my summary slide. So let me walk you through what happens. This is the DMD approximation, straight up that we started with. And its error is this line here. Was how do I compute the error? I take the exact solution that I had, which is the numerical solution, and I just say, well, here's my exact solution, which was from running that whole thing, versus my DMD approximation. And you can see the error. This is 10 to the 0. So it's like, essentially, it's around 10 to the minus 1. OK? Here, and here's where the eigenvalues are. I already showed you that. Actually, it might be better if they're going to film this up. I'll just move to here. This is this new set of variables where it was the measurement was x mod x squared x, motivated by the nonlinearity. This is the reconstruction. You can't see too much difference here, but I'll show you the difference in a minute. The eigenvalues are, boom, exactly where they should be on that imaginary axis. The error between my approximation using those variables, remember, I have a linear model now. I have a linear model approximating the dynamics. And the error between the nonlinear dynamics and the linear dynamics is this one right here. This is on a log plot. It's down here around 10 minus 4, 5, 6. This is around where OD4, 5 error was to generate, da generate the data. I'm almost at numerical precision. Boom. Is this an exact linear embedding? It is not. But it's pretty damn close. And all I did is pick the good variable. Okay. However, what if I picked a bad variable? x mod x squared, not mod x squared x, right? Just the intensity. Here's the reconstruction. Sucks. Here are the eigenvalues. Suck. The error. So I actually did worse. Why? Because I picked a variable that was awful. It wasn't somehow anywhere near where the subspace of the dynamics happened. So when you pick DMD, when you do this Koopman embedding trick, you can see the kinds of possibilities that are there for you. If I pick a great variable set, it can be an amazing tool for you. Because now I have a linear model. That nonlinear PDE, I say, oh, that's easy. Here's a matrix. How far in the future do you want to go? My matrix k is this. So if you want to go 10 steps into the future, just k, k to the 10. Linear system. Easy. I can write down the eigenvalues, eigenvectors. I know everything about it. I can even control it. I have a linear model now. If I pick a bad variable set, which is easy to do, by the way, you can end up over here, where you actually did a lot worse. Now, how do you know? Well, typically, it's not bad. I just go and see how well did I do with reconstruction. Usually when bad variables, you pick them, they actually announce themselves to you and say, look at me, look how bad I am. <laughs> it's not like it's that hard to know, like, did I get a good or bad variable? It's like, it just shows you, it's like, I am a really bad variable for you. 
Okay? So that's Koopman. See you Friday.